Hello modellers and railway enthusiasts. Do you have a passing interest in viaducts or bridges? Perhaps your model railway would benefit from one to add that all important third dimension, height. Victorian architecture plays a very large part on our network, as this trip to the Welland Valley Viaduct, Britain's longest masonry viaduct, proves. I thought I'd bring you today to Little Bytham, or this is where we're going to start off on our little trip actually because uh, we're going to take a look at viaducts. You'll have seen there's a feature in this issue of the magazine entirely dedicated to viaducts and how to create one for your model railway. Um, and uh, I thought I'd start actually with a bridge because essentially a viaduct is a series of bridges. So uh, let's take a look at this one behind me. And switching quickly to voiceover because I soon realised that the busy road made recording audio virtually impossible, let's take a closer look at this bridge. This used to carry the Midland and Great Northern Line, though was closed to traffic in 1959. To the other side, if you have a sheet of plastic brickwork, self-adhesive brick paper, or perhaps you're braver still and hope to scribe your bricks by hand, best of luck, consider roughening the odd brick to create this effect. We also find bolt holes, possibly left behind by a sign at some point, while the top 13 courses of brick have been replaced with similar blue engineering bricks. On closer inspection we find damaged brickwork, possibly through water ingress which upon freezing expands to force bricks and mortar lines to crack. There's also a fair amount of vegetation too, ivy to the left, trees growing in the soil above and to the right large shrubs and trees. Every I'd say every 10 rows maybe more, 15 rows, we've got a different colour of engineering brick there. This is actually quite a dark blue brick that's been used in this. Another key detail you can take away from looking at the underside of bridges like this and that is uh, water ingress and how it uh, how the salts come out through the bricks and it all sort of weathers and you create this white streaking further on the other side of the wall and it's the same on the other sides of the walls as well um, you get lots of mineral deposits on the inside face of the brick and that's also a lot of uh, obviously pollution as well from the cars going through So literally just a stone's throw away we've got this three arch bridge, or viaduct even, although strictly speaking Network Rail class this as a bridge because uh, according to this sign here it is bridge East Coast Main Line 1 slash 210. The original viaduct pictured centre was constructed in 1850 but when the twin tracks were widened to four in 1910 rather than demolish the structure two similar viaducts were added either side, each destined to carry a line. Interestingly the span of the arches and hence their radii are different to the original bridge and this would make an interesting modelling proposition. To the side we find more modern additions such as the flight of concrete steps with galvanised metal handrail warning signs against trespass and the dangers of the overhead live wires, and contact numbers in the event of an emergency. Despite its age, the arches remain in remarkably good shape, and only a little green damp to the brickwork highlights the moist conditions above of the exposed ballast over the soil. A smaller arch can be found to the left-hand side, and again, the return of more vegetation with potentially brick-damaging roots. Well, we're quite fortunate that uh, in this neck of the woods we are actually uh, quite blessed with many viaducts and, uh, well, just a little bit further down the road we find ourselves with uh, Bridge East Coast Mainline 1 slash 216. Located near Creton, this viaduct carrying the East Coast Mainline has undergone a similar widening process to that previously seen at Little Bytham. With additional structures either side, both similarly proportioned to the original, even the foundation run of bricks completed with a run of plinth bricks match those of the original. And, despite the speed of trains passing on the rails above today, the gap between each remains small. As rainfall and water ingress prevails, no doubt more so during the winter months, we see an accumulation of moss growth on the outer walls of the viaduct. Observing such small details and weathering your model to suit, be it with powders or a little flock, can really elevate those finishing touches. Note the ornate cast iron downpipes leading to a soakaway for drainage too. 
This viaduct lacks a winged retaining wall to the sides, possibly because of the low angle of the slope of soil. So, if you don't quite fancy modelling all that extra brickwork, consider this as a solution, all while making your model look right to the eye. Moving a little further down the road we find this skewed bridge, a feature rarely modelled on layouts, possibly because of the complexity, but perhaps also because of a lack of understanding of them too. Besides a healthy amount of vegetation sprouting from the courses of the angled wing walls, I thought it would be a good opportunity to study how the brickwork is achieved under the arch. Remember, this is a bridge, and though skewed viaducts aren't as common, they do exist and might just add a little more interest to your layout than a standard viaduct. A skewed bridge or viaduct is one that isn't perpendicular to the road or river passing or flowing underneath it. Looking underneath the arch here you'll note how the bricks follow a helicoidal line, always running perpendicular to the two outer arches. Hopefully this might provide inspiration before you decide to cut into your next sheet of plastic brickwork, or scribe into that freshly applied modelling clay or foam material. And so it was time to visit the mother of all viaducts, the longest of its type in the country and still in use today. Located in Rutland, measuring 1,275 yards in length and at a cost when constructed equivalent to £1.4 million per mile in today's money, is the Welland Valley Viaduct. Right, well I'm now at uh, the Welland or Haringworth Viaduct, which crosses the River Welland and uh, three other roads. And... Uh, this is GSMI-42, the longest viaduct in the United Kingdom. So underneath the bridge, we've, uh, or at least under this arch, we've got a bit of a history of the, uh, the line, uh, the navvies who obviously were instrumental in the construction of the, uh, the viaduct. Um, and uh, it was construction of this started in 1876. Um, until 1878, but the first trains didn't actually circulate until 1880. Well, I can't get down that side because that's private property, but there is a little style here, so uh, let's just wander through. I think each of these arches is approximately 60 foot in height, um, but one of the things that you probably won't spot are these large drains, which are... Uh, I mean, it's July, it's a, it's a good week since we've had any decent rain, and uh, they are still dripping water. So in winter, you can imagine there's quite a lot of water coming out of these, just dripping onto the land below. Now, constructed in blue engineering bricks, it's had a lot of red brick slips put in recently, over the years. Uh, most recently, it's been repointed, and the plan is to increase line speed from 20 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour and um, I'm, I'm told that's by, uh, funnily enough, making cuts to some areas of the viaduct to allow for uh, expansion or contraction or rather um, so that the shear um, will take place there rather than in the bricks. Something I find quite interesting looking at this viaduct um, is these little indents in the, uh, the columns. Uh, obviously we haven't got any here. This one has two. You can just zoom in. Uh, the one next to it only has just the one. Perhaps the one next to it was filled in or uh, they were slightly higher up. You can see there's been some repair work there. Now obviously any structure of a significant age is going to uh, have a bit of repair work required from time to time. We've got the change from blue engineering brick to red. On the underside there and um, there have even been some repairs in other colors of bricks as I shall now demonstrate so there we go we've got the bit of repointing work going on under the arches there some of these arches we have iron rods which will go from one side of the arch right the way through to the other uh, to sort of tie the two arches or two arch faces if that makes sense uh, in with each other and prevent them from uh, from moving outwards. And yes, a feature that is common on many pieces of architecture today, the obligatory graffiti. 
Yeah, I suspect they've got the right idea. We'd probably get a great view from plane. Well, it looks like I've reached a bit of an impasse on that side. There's a, a road and a bit of a, a ditch to get to the other side. So I'm going to hop back in the car now and uh, see if we can see something from a little bit further down. Um, see what we can find on the viaduct at the other end. The viaduct is located next to the small village of Harringworth and, from a public footpath through a field of sheep, I was able to observe it more closely. Here we can see similar repair work, but also note the additional brick buttresses fitted to each wider ninth column. Well there you go, I hope you've enjoyed a look at these bridges and viaducts. Don't forget, if you'd like to have a go at something like this on your model railway, perhaps not this long, but if you do, my hat's off to you, feel free to send us an email to brm at warnersgroup.co.uk. We'd love to see what you've created and modelled, and perhaps you might even get featured in the mag. <laughs>